Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. Princess Gwendolyn and the Shadow Clan. This is written by Michael Wolf, and it's the next book in the Benevolia series, and I'm really happy that Michael's here to tell me all about it. Michael, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. So this is book two of the Benevolia series. Can you tell me what this one's about and about the series in general? So the Benevolia series is actually about kind of a world adventure. And so Princess Gwendolyn and the Shadow Clan is a great story about two princess sisters who are taken to a foreign hostile area from their home. And they manage to escape with the help of a local. This local teams up with them and helps agree to get them home by sneaking back through the territory in order to get them home before their kingdom is overthrown. Now, this is book two of a series where Benevolia, it will be revealed that Benevolia is the name of their world. Hmm. The idea behind the Benevolia series is that you will meet new characters and explore this world while they actually try to save it from utter destruction. Very interesting. How'd you come up with the idea for this story? I had created, when I was a lot younger, several different short stories of different main characters. And I came to the idea that instead of just telling 20 different small stories, it would be much more intriguing and more in-depth if I picked a few and connected them into one big grand adventure. Mm. This way, it would provide more depth and more, not realism, but a sense that this is an actual place and a setting and give it more personality, as it were. Mm. When it comes to the kinds of readers you think would be really into this, would you say fans of the fantasy genre? Oh, absolutely. It's a big fantasy adventure. I made it light enough for younger, very young, like 10-year-olds to read it without being scarred for life. But um, honestly, I put in subtle tones and messages and symbolism so that even an older reader could actually still enjoy the book as well. Hmm. I understand you're working on more books in the series, of course. Have you planned out how far out this is going to go? I'm thinking 12. Hmm. I really want to do 12 books, and I really, really want to make this series just open world and very expansive, traveling this mythical realm, different people, different characters, different races and backgrounds, and they all just come together in one big epic story. Michael, how long does it take it to write one of these books? I would say these two were definitely the, they're going to be the shortest. They're, they're supposed to grow as it goes. That was the idea, mm. to give you a nice short story and then grow it as you kind of grow with the story. So these books themselves took months, I would say eight months of writing, editing, taking some things out, putting some things in, you know, having ideas like later on, like, oh, that'd be a good addition, you know, and then putting it in and making it work. I would say each book took about eight months, but the future ones are going to be much longer, so they'll probably take longer. Mm. And after all that time and work that you put into it, when you finally get that first physical copy in, you get to hold it for the first time, you're looking at it, what's going through your head? A lot of tears, a lot of emotions, because this was a dream come true. This was something I wanted since I was eight years old, and actually holding your book in your hand for the first time, it's an experience unlike anything else it really is because you knew the story you knew how it was supposed to go to actually hold it in your hands and know that other people can do the same it's unreal looking back over all your writing now michael what's the most rewarding thing now of being a published author for you having accomplished it to be honest with you i mean it seemed like such a far-fetched dream and just something i wanted so bad for so long that i didn't want to ever give up and i wanted to accomplish it and when i actually held the book in my hands and i was able to let other people enjoy the stories because i did have some people who read it and absolutely loved the story it was just it became surreal well, i encourage my listeners to check this book out and this whole series it's called princess gwendolyn and the shadow clan of course, this is book two in the Benevolia series, and it's written by Michael Wolf. 
You can find this everywhere like Amazon and Barnes and Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick and mortar stores. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you today, Michael. Thank you so much for joining me and telling me all about the series. I hope we can do this again. Absolutely. I really appreciate it, and I thank you for your time. I'm really happy to welcome back to the show author Gisela Bengford. Gisela, thank you for joining me once again. Thanks, Corey. It's good to talk to you. Well, it's really great to talk to you. You've had an exciting time here. I understand that you've won an award for your first book for Wolfie's Adventure and Unlikely Friendship. So first of all, I just wanted to extend my congratulations. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. It's very exciting. <laughs> Indeed. Absolutely. You got another one out. It's brand new, hit stores. It's called Wolfie's Adventure Away From Home. So can you tell me what Wolfie's doing in this one? Yes, uh, Away From Home is the continuing adventure of Wolfie the Rat and Fate the Red Shoulder Hawk. It's their inspiring journey into uncharted terrain along the coast, encountering many new animals. Some are friendly, some not so much. It teaches empathy and courage and that everything is possible if you put your heart into it. I love that message. What sorts of age range of children do you think would get the most out of it? It is for children from six to nine years old. The story is unique as I pose questions to the reader and listener to engage them, make them think about it, and not just consume the story. Hmm. Now, this is your second book in Wolfie's series here. Do you find the writing and publishing getting easier for you? Yes. The writing is still very exciting. Mm. I don't, never, never struggle with come up with an adventure. It's to get your book out. It's the harder part. Because you're kind of a tree in the woods. People need to see that tree. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Have you thought about what Wolfie's doing next? Do you have more books planned out? Yes. My third book is almost finished, as it is kind of a trilogy. I'm using real life events and the animal's behavior are factual. I try to wave that in in a funny way that kids actually learn about the wild animals and get excited and can show some empathy toward the animals in general. It is my passion. And I love the positivity to your message. You know, there's so much out there that can just bring it down. And your writing seems to be a beacon of light, especially towards children. That's so important to be encouraging that way. Yes. Children are so inspirable. I got inspired by my granddaughter, mm -hmm. Cameron. She told me during the pandemic that I should write the story down. And to watch their curious faces, their giggles, their unfiltered views, and listen to their great questions alone are so inspirable and contagious. When you sit down to write, you said you don't have really any trouble coming up with ideas. How do you find the ideas? How do you find out what you're going to write about next? It's life presents it actually almost every day. You go out and you observe things and then you think, hmm. And that could be part of a story or look at your own life and events and, you know, connect that. Mm. Gisela, a lot of authors have trouble even getting started because they're afraid of what others might think of their work. How do you get past that, knowing that you're putting your stuff out there and not everybody's going to like it? Well, I really address children as they, like I said, they're so untainted, unfiltered. Many times when they answer the questions, it's nothing what I expected because it's so fresh. And it's just, I love doing what I'm doing. And I'm not so worried what other people might think. Some will love my book, some not, but that's life. Gisela, what do you find the most rewarding about writing and publishing, putting your work out there for the world and especially for children? It's the smile on their faces. They're attending, curious, and to interact with children when I do readings. I absolutely love that. Mm. One of my favorites. I know a lot of readers, a lot of children are really going to love this book. It's titled Wolfie's Adventure, Away from Home. It's written by Gisela Bengfort and is published by Fulton Books. Of course, you can grab this anywhere, Amazon and Barnes & Noble and iTunes and Google Play and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. And Gisela, it's been wonderful talking with you here again. Thanks for talking about Wolfie's next adventure, and I can't wait to hear about the next one after this. Thanks again for joining me. 
Thanks, Corey. Thanks for having me and stay safe and have fun. Faith and Love. It's the new book. It's out in stores right now. It's written by Gary Williams, and Gary is joining me here right now to talk all about it. Gary, thanks for being here with me tonight. Thank you for offering. It's really exciting. Faith and Love is available everywhere. Can you tell me what this book's all about? Basically, it's about a young man who wants to serve his country, so he joins the Marine Corps. He's sent to Afghanistan. And he winds up in a battle with Taliban, and he is seriously injured. His best friend is killed, and the uh, hero of the story is named Derek. Well, after Derek convalescents in the hospital, he's given leave, and he decides he wants to go and talk to the families of the Marines who were killed with him in that battle. He finds himself in a little town in North Carolina, or the mountains of North Carolina, towns called Tyler. He meets and falls in love with a young lady who is unavailable to him. So he returns back to the Marine Corps, finishes out his service. And when he's discharged, he becomes a police officer in a little town in uh, Florida. He finds himself in wild car chases, wrestling alligators, and getting in gunfight with a uh, serial killer. At that time, he discovered that really police work wasn't his thing. So he asked God for lead, guide, and direction, and he wound up going to seminary and becoming a pastor. When he became a pastor, as luck would have it, he found himself back in the small town of Tyler, where he was the pastor at one of the churches. And in Tyler, some mysteries and things occurred. There's some twists and turns, but in the end, Derek finds his true faith and his true love. Wow, what a story, Gary. Where'd you get the idea for this? Well, let me tell you, and before you cut me off, let me explain it. God gave it to me. I like reading. I've read thousands of books. And here lately, it's hard to find a good secular book that isn't filled full of filth. Mm. So I was complaining to my wife one day as I helped her fold the clothes, and I heard a small voice in my left ear say, well, go write a book. I told my wife, I said, I think God just told me to write a book. And being the smart woman she is, she said, well, there's only one way to find out. Go write a book. <laughs> so the next morning after my devotions and prayers and all, I sat down at my computer and I had no idea what I was going to do because I had never even dreamed of writing a book. Mm. But all of a sudden, all these ideas started flooding my mind and I started writing. And I had written the first chapter in about two and a half hours. Wow. Did the book take you a long time to finish? To finish the book itself, working about two to three hours a day for a little over six weeks, I finished it. What was it like then after all that time and being your first book to finally get that first copy in your hands and be able to hold it? What was that moment like for you? Well, it's really hard to describe, but I will tell you this. To me, it meant a lot because it showed me that God wasn't through with me yet. He still had plans for me. Mm. At the same time, I was excited because I had never written a book, had never thought about it, didn't even have a clue as to how to go about it. And yet, here I had a book I was holding in my hand. Are there any chances maybe of a sequel to this or maybe another book in your future? Well, yes to that question. Uh, Number one, I already have another book at the publisher now, Mm. and I am working presently on the sequel to this book. And I assume you learned an awful lot along the way of writing your first book, Gary. What advice now would you have for people who are just about to do the same thing? Well, I would just tell them, go for it. Mm -hmm. Don't be scared. There's nothing to lose. I've talked with a couple of people who said that they had felt God telling them to write a book, but they never did, and they really regret it. So don't regret it. Give it a shot. Try it. Mm, Great advice. Well, it sounds like a fantastic book, and I think my listeners ought to check it out. It's titled, Faith and Love. It's written by Gary Williams, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Make sure you get the right one. It's a blue and white cover with a soldier on the front, and they are in the process of making an audiobook version of this, too. Well, Gary, it's been wonderful chatting with you today. Thank you so much for telling me about Faith and Love. I had a really great time. Thank you for calling. Thanks a lot. If you're a parent, you know very well that you would do anything for your children. 
And the new book by Allison B. Arney called I Give You the Moon is celebrating that. And I'm really happy that Allison is right here with me now to chat about it. Allison, thanks for being here tonight. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. Can you tell me all about I Give You the Moon? Sure. I Give You the Moon is really applicable to all parents, but specifically from my own heart as a mother to my children, the prayers that I have for their life as they grow up, the future and what that holds for them, and just the prayers that a parent has that their children would always know that their love will be there for them to return home to and as a source of support as they continue to grow and find their own life. Hmm. How did you come up with the idea for I Give You the Moon? I was actually rocking my youngest when she was a newborn, and we were trying to get her to settle down a little bit, and the fan was on with one of those projectors that put stars on the ceiling. And I started reaching up into the sky and pretending to pull those stars down and just started speaking to her some of the words that became the first lines of this book. So it kind of developed from there. Every night we rocked and the book got a little longer in my head. Mm. Was it a book that took you a long time to put together? Not really. Honestly, it probably took a few nights of rocking. Maybe within a week, I had it all put together. But I knew almost instantly that this was a book that God had put on my heart that I wanted to take further. So I was very intentional to continue to develop the words that I was speaking into her. Hmm. And of course, the illustrations are very important here. What was that process like? It was really fun. I typically do not claim myself to be a visual person. So beginning to articulate, I did not do the illustrations myself. Thankfully, someone helped me with them. But be, beginning to articulate what I imagined those scenes to look like, because they were all very vivid in my head. I could see them all. But getting the image out of my head and onto paper for someone else to interpret was a bit of a leap of faith. <laughs> but <laughs> I have to credit the good Lord there for giving me some words to figure out how to put it together. And the illustrator did a phenomenal job of bringing those images to life in a way that portrays myself and my three girls. And at the end, my husband joins us and we just walk through life together, basically. Hmm. Allison, what's your writing background look like? Have you ever done anything like this before? Not with a book. I was an editor for a newspaper back in high school and college and did a lot of writing there. I did some poetry at a young age as well and had published that, but this was my first book, so that was very exciting for me. I'm sure it was very exciting, especially that moment when you got the first copy in. What was that like? I was actually on a meeting. I run another business as an HR consultant, and I saw on our ring doorbell that a package delivered. And so while I'm on this I'm sorry to say, not that exciting Zoom call. <laughs> I did check the image and could tell that it was probably the book based on the size of the package. And so I anxiously awaited getting off of that meeting <laughs> and ran down and opened the door to get that. And it was just so surreal. I had seen the edits, but holding it in your hands is just something totally different. It was very emotional. It was a lot of fun, though. Mm. What are the chances you'll be writing maybe a follow-up to this or some other kind of book in the future? I have begun working on another book, mm. uh, another children's book that will feature my youngest and her best friend. So publishing your first book, I'm sure you learned an awful lot along the way. What advice would you give to somebody who's also just starting out in this? You know, one thing that I did different with this process than almost anything I'd really done in my life was that I kept this completely to myself. Mm. My husband knew about it. He was the only one that had read it. My kids had heard it, obviously, because I would speak it to them. <laughs> But no one knew the images other than the illustrator and the publisher. No one knew the details more than just the subject and the fact that I was publishing a children's book. Mm -hmm. And it was really important for me to do that because I wanted this to be truly my vision. And I wanted it to be truly what God had put on my heart without the opinions of other people. And I am very blessed to have phenomenal friends and family. But because we're all so close, we're so quick to give each other opinions. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want it tainted by those, anyone else's mind but my own. And so that was really tough because it's an exciting process. But I would really challenge another author to make sure that you take the time and write it first and really put it out there the way that you want it to be mm. and not let the opinions of others adjust that so that it's really what's on your heart and not a conglomerate of what you think will make people happy. Because I think with publishing a book, the biggest challenge is wondering, will people like it? So by instinct, we want to go get other people's opinions first. But just trust your own heart. Trust what God has given you to put down on paper and run with it and see where it goes. Keep it pure. Well, as a parent myself, this book really strikes a chord with me. It's called I Give You the Moon. 
It's written by Allison B. Arney, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can pick this up anywhere, Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Allison, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you so much for talking about I Give You the Moon and all of your work. I hope we can talk again sometime. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to it as well. Even the Butterflies Died of Grief. That's the new book. It's out right now, written by Terrence Patrick McGowan. And Terrence is right here with me now to chat about it. Terrence, thanks for joining me here tonight. Oh, my pleasure. What's great that even the Butterflies Died of Grief is out there everywhere in stores now. So can you tell me what this is all about? Well, I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give the plot away, okay? Because I think it has a lot to it. I, I know I'm prejudiced. I wrote it. But I don't want to give the plot away. It's a story really about how fear is the opposite of love, mm -hmm. not hate. And two individuals, two teenagers, they discover they, they're rooming together. They, one was adopted into the other one's family, and they're living together. And they discover at some point in time that they feel love for each other, and they're confused. They don't know if it's gay love or brotherly love. And that's kind of where the book explores that. Mm -hmm. Where did the idea for this come from? Well, believe it or not, it came from a dream. Hmm. I woke up in 2011 with that title in my head, and I thought, okay, the universe wants me to write a book about this. So that's why the title is what it is. Hmm. At the time, I didn't know what, quite what to write, but I knew that I'd be patient and it would come to me. And a few years later, all of a sudden, I had both conversations with others and experiences that gave me the plot. Hmm. Was there a certain readership you had in mind for this? You know, I was writing just to write. Hmm. I like to write. This is my second book. Hmm wrote about my experiences in Afghanistan as well. But I think it's really meant for, I'll tell you what, I was reading it to a friend of mine who was an older guy, he was in his 70s, and I read it to him and I said, guys like you need to read this. Mm -hmm. It explores the societal taboos that keep everybody locked in. Mm -hmm. I mean, why couldn't these two boys be normal and love each other? Why couldn't they? And that's kind of the essence of the book. Mm -hmm. Did this take you a long time to write and put through the publishing process? It took a long time, yes. Mm. I mean, like I said, this is my second book. The first book was about Afghanistan. It was about my experiences over there. And that was easier because I worked off of emails that I had sent to people. And that became my, my guideline. Mm. But this one was purely coming out of creativity. I have a lot of dialogue in it, a lot of description. A lot of what's in the book is real. Mm. That is to say, the dialogue is real, the descriptions are real, and the overall background is real. Now, other than that, it's fiction. But yeah, it took a long time to write because... When I write something, I typically go back to the beginning every time I sit down and I write it again. I sent it off to people and said, what do you think? What do you think? And I incorporated some of their suggestions. I also would write it on my computer and I'd print it out. To me, it reads differently on paper than it does on, on a screen. Hmm. But, you know, that's me. And I just kept making corrections and subtly changing things and, until it was the way I wanted it to be. Hmm. Terrence, can you talk about that moment when you got the first finished physical copy in your hands and you held it for the first time? What was that like? Well, I liked it, of course. I really think it's going to do well because I think the universe wants it. Mm. I think there's a lot of people out there that need to read it. I think there's a lot of kids out there that need to read it because they're not sure. They're questioning themselves. and They need to read it so that they know they're okay. And their parents need to read it so the parents don't know that they're okay. I think over time, it's going to do that. I think this particular book might make a good movie. Mm. The first one I wrote would not. It's just, just too limited. My experiences in Afghanistan, nah, I could make a movie out of that. But this book could be a movie. Who knows? Maybe it get picked up and disseminated that way. Have you considered maybe doing a follow-up to this one? I want to write again. I, you know, I, I love writing. Mm. Right now, I'm trying to come up with a theme. I'm trying to come up with something else I can write about. This book does not lend itself to a series. Mm. I mean, when the story ends, the story ends. There's no picking it up. But I'm, I am trying to come up with something I can write about again. A lot of listeners right now are writers who are just starting out. So, Terrence, do you have any advice that you could offer them to get them going? Well, yeah. Just keep reading your stuff. Just keep going back to the beginning and reading it through. It's going to seem different every time you do it. And you're going to see things and make subtle changes every time. And you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. With the first book, I was in touch with a published author. I said, you know, every time I sit down, I change it. He says, every author does that. And he had just read the manuscript and he said, it's ready. Send it to a publisher. And that's the way that this, this time I just did it myself. I decided it was ready and had it published. Mm. For those who are struggling through writing, it is a struggle, but it was very rewarding for me. I tell you what, I'll be honest. I actually cried <laughs> when oh. I read my own book. Mm. And I'm thinking, why am I crying? I wrote this. I could change this. I can make the ending different. I, I, why am I crying? <laughs> but I choked up. To me, the story just was just so compelling. Wow. Terrence's book is titled, Even the Butterflies Died of Grief. It's written by Terrence Patrick McGowan, and it's published by Newman Springs Publishing. 
Pick this up everywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Terrence, thank you again for coming by the show and chatting about even the butterflies died of grief. I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Little Man Adventures, Walk to the Castle. It's the new children's book. It's out in stores right now, written by Michael Wayne. I'm really happy to have Michael right here with me now to talk about it. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate you being here. Can you tell me all about Little Man Adventures, Walk to the Castle? Sure. It's kind of a discovery adventure, very imaginative. It's a young boy discovering the world around him. He starts off, he sees a castle in the distance and determines that I've got the courage to go find it. And it's what he runs into as he discovers along the way. Hmm. So it's pretty straightforward. It's a lot of fun. It's kind of a dreamscape. It was illustrated in watercolor. So the child kind of builds into the story what they see. Hmm. What age range of children do you think would be most into this? Well, start off with the ones you're reading to, whatever age you want to start that, up through early readers, say 10, 12 years old. And I love the cover. You talked about the watercolors and everything used in this. What was the illustration process like in this? Well, it was funny because if you've ever read to a child or, or had a child read a book back to you, they often use the pictures to kind of build their own story. And so the illustration, I wanted to kind of keep it loose and dreamlike. I enjoyed doing watercolor, but there was that kind of play back and forth with keeping it something the kids could pull into. How did the idea for this come to you? Well, the idea for it, Little Man is actually my grandson. Hmm. My wife and I were independent missionaries to Guatemala, and so I started off writing little letters to Little Man, and it kind of developed into a storyline once we got back. Mm. Was this your first venture then into the world of writing and publishing? Into the world of writing? No. I've always enjoyed writing as much as I do reading. As far as publishing, yeah, this would be my first. I don't intend for it to be my last. That's wonderful. I was going to ask you what the chances are, maybe a follow-up to this or maybe some other kind of book. There's a natural connection in, the, in this book to an additional, another adventure. He's standing on a bridge at one point, and he, he's watching the stream as it goes off into the distance, and he says, I wonder where that goes. So that gives you a natural lead-in for a second book. And I do have several other stories kind of in my head, not, not on paper yet, but in my head anyway. That's fantastic. I can imagine it must have been a special moment for you receiving the first copy of this and getting to look at it and hold it in your hands for the first time. Can you tell me about that moment? Oh, it was absolutely wonderful. Of course, you know, you get a lot of deliveries nowadays and they leave them at the door and you open the door and find it. So it was for me that moment of discovery when I opened the box to see my watercolors and to see the book all put together was kind of great. A lot of people listening right now are authors who are just starting out. So, Mike, do you have any advice that you could offer them? Just getting started. Well, keep writing. Find your voice. And then you reach out to a publisher, and, and between the two of you, you make decisions as to whether this needs to move forward. But it's just have confidence in yourself. Hmm. That was probably, in many ways, my biggest holdup is I know I like what I read. Having the confidence to know somebody else is going to like it, and then taking that risk to step forward. A, a real good friend of mine uses the phrase, chicken if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little push there. So Love it. Well, you've been writing a lot. What is so rewarding about the whole thing for you? Why do you keep putting in all this work and all this energy? Well, it's like I said, it's it's finding your voice. It gives me the opportunity to, to kind of explore. And when I'm able to share with others, it gives me an opportunity to, to kind of see that same joy when they start doing the same thing. Mm. Writing becomes almost cathartic. In the sense that I review my day, if I'm, if I'm journaling, I'll review my day and say the images that, that come back to me is usually what I write about. Mm. Do you often write on a routine, maybe early in the morning or late at night, or do you find yourself writing whenever you find that inspiration? Wow, all of the above, really. <laughs> For me, journaling is, is a morning thing as I'm getting started in the day. When we were in Guad, it was real easy. I'd get up and fix myself a cup of hot tea and kind of ponder what had happened the day before. Mm. You know, as you get started for the day. But then when inspiration strikes, you kind of have to sit down and go with it and make time available. Michael, have you ever sat down to write? You feel inspired to write, and then all of a sudden nothing comes out. You can't find the words. You maybe get writer's block, or you're maybe stuck for ideas. How do you get through the challenges like that? Well, in those situations, your best bet is just to try and be creative, look at something close by. And it goes back to lessons I learned in creative writing in high school. 
you don't have to write about an inspiration. You write, and the inspiration will come back, and then you find the words. It's really kind of an odd process, but, you know, I've written, I've looked out on the back porch and written about the squirrels running along the top of the fence. Seems kind of silly, but it's straightforward, and then you move on from there. Hmm. I encourage my listeners to check this book out. It's titled Little Man Adventures, Walk to the Castle. It's written by Michael Wayne, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can find this everywhere. Get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Michael, it's been great speaking with you here tonight. Thank you for telling me about your work, and I hope we can do this again sometime. I hope so, Corey. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm really happy to be sitting down right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable with author Mary Walker. Mary, thanks for joining me tonight. Thank you for calling. Your new book is titled Women of Peace and Justice, Stories of Women in the Bible and History. Can you tell me all about this? Well, this book is about significant women in the Bible and history. There's 36 stories in the book. The first 12 are from the Bible because I believe it's important to see that God has always called and gifted women for service. Mm. Since I think this is a timeless truth, we would expect to see women fulfilling their commissions to serve throughout history, and indeed we do. The next 24 stories in the book are an excursion from the early church to modern times, telling the stories of women who brought peace and justice to their cultures. Hmm. Mary, what sorts of readers do you think would really be into this? Well, I think the title is, a lot of people are wondering about peace and justice. People long for peace, and they're discouraged when they don't find lasting peace. In the book, they'll discover that lasting peace comes through Jesus Christ. There's been a lot of confusion over the term justice. I'm not sure why, because as Christians, we want God's justice, and we know God cares about justice Mm -hmm. because there's nearly 2,000 references to it in the Bible. So using a small sample of about 20 verses, I clarify God's instructions on justice. And then the women in the book whose stories I tell demonstrate how God called and gifted them to bring peace, the peace of Christ, and the justice of God to their society. Wow. Is this a book that took you a long time to write and put together? No, it took about a year to put it together, but I've had a blog for about 12 years Hmm. since 2010, and I have over 450 stories on there. Wow. So (laughs) basically, I just had to choose some stories, and I picked them to reflect the theme of peace and justice. But yes, it took around a year to put it all together. Hmm. Can you go back and think about the time you were inspired to sit down and write and publish this? Well, yeah. I love reading history books, especially church history books, and I found that many of them don't include the stories of women. Some books didn't even have one woman in them. Mm. (laughs) It troubles me that the lack of women's stories leads to the belief that women aren't as important as men. Mm. So I decided to do some research, and I discovered thousands of significant women, including queens, empresses, abbesses, nuns, writers, godly wives, mothers, social reformers, missionaries, prophets, evangelists preachers, doctors, artists, and many more. These women contributed greatly to the kingdom of God, not so they could be remembered, but so they could serve the Lord Jesus by serving others. After all the work that you put into this, when you finally got that first copy and you got to hold it in your hands, look at it for the first time, Mary, what was that moment like for you? Well, a lot of people supported me through this and and helped me and encouraged me and I was just grateful, I guess, that it finally came out. And Mm -hmm. also, I could share copies with them and say, look, here it is. Thank you for your help. (laughs) Do you think you'll be writing more and publishing more in the future? Well, last year, the first book in this series, Women of Faith and Courage, was published by Christian Faith Publishing. This one came out this year. I just submitted book three, Women of Truth and Righteousness, Mm -hmm. to them a month or two ago. That's really a a total altogether of the three books of 108 stories, which only scratches the surface of the thousands of stories that are out there of women. But again, I'm really happy to be living in a time like this when women are finally getting some recognition. But I think we have a long way to go, and I'm happy to contribute this way. Mm, That's wonderful. We have a lot of authors listening right now who are just starting out. So, Mary, what advice could you give them? I'd say don't put it off. Get started. Write something every day, even if it's just five minutes write something. Try and put in a half an hour to an hour or more as you can. Time goes by really quickly and it won't be long and you'll have your accomplished work. Mm. Mary, you've written quite a lot. So what to you is the most rewarding aspect of having your work out there and being published for the world? Well, when, especially on my blog, when readers respond Mm. and thank me for writing the stories and interact with them, 
I really love that. How wonderful. The book is titled Women of Peace and Justice, Stories of Women in the Bible and History. It's written by Mary Walker, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can pick this one up anywhere like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. It's been wonderful speaking with you tonight here, Mary. Thank you so much for being on the show. I hope we can do this again sometime. All right. Maybe next year when the third one comes out. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. I'm really happy that right now, here at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm chatting with author Rochelle Phillips. Rochelle, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great, and I imagine you're doing well as well because you have a new book out in stores right now called The Adventures of AJ. Can you tell me all about that? Well, it started out as a school project for my daughter. She came home with some spelling words she needed to make a short story from, so I let her write, so I asked her to help, and she said, yes, no problem. And, you know, after that, you know, we wrote the story and she turned it in. A teacher, of course, said she knows she didn't write it, <laughs> but she gave her you know, a good grade anyway. So after that, you know, the rest is history. <laughs> what gave you the idea to publish it? I was sick in the hospital, you know, and they said I only had a little while to live. So wow. they asked me what was my greatest fear. And I told them I need to leave something, you know, a legacy behind for my daughters. Mm hmm and I mentioned the book, and they said, well, hey, we'll get it published. And so I got it published when I got out the hospital. Oh, and by the way, that was in 2020, when they said I only had a little while to live. So God has the last word. So that's why I'm still here. That was over almost two years ago. Wow, I'm so glad you pulled through. What age range of children do you think would be most into this? From, say, 5 to 11. Have you ever done anything like this before when it comes to writing a book or being published? Uh, this is my first time being published. Hmm. I've been trying to write a novel about, you know, how you uh, explain to a little child why Jesus died the way he did. Hmm. So I've been trying to work on that. And I'm, I'm almost through with that. Just got a lot of poems written, like 200 poems I need to get published. Hmm. You know, Christian poems, poems about basically anything. So, you know, I just love to write. Yeah, I can tell. Now, The Adventures of AJ is a really personal book for you, Rochelle. So what was that moment like when the first copy came in and you got to hold it for the first time? I'm still processing. <laughs> to be <laughs> honest with you, I'm still processing. But, you know, every time I look at it, I say, wow. <laughs> you know, mm. see my name in print. So I'm still processing, but it feels great, to be honest with you. I need to get a couple of more done, make him feel better. <laughs> <laughs> the illustrations are so important in children's books. What was that like for you? Ooh, that was a hard decision because I never really thought about doing anything like that. But after, you know, after I started doing it, I, I got off in that too as well. Mm. So I love the illustration part. I don't know if I can improve on that, but, you know, <laughs> I just love it the way it's illustrated and everything. Mm. I'm sure you learned an awful lot along the way of publishing your first book, Rochelle. So what advice would you have now for authors who are just starting out and want to do the same thing? Just give it a try. Of course, you're going to make mistakes along the way. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. You know, just put it down on paper and look at it and see what, you know, other people think about it. That's what I did. You know, I got other people's opinion and everybody liked it. So that's, that's what got me started. Don't be afraid to be disappointed and put it that way. You know, everybody not going to like your work. Of course, everybody didn't like it. But like I said, you know, God has the last word, so I got it done. And Lord willing, we get some more bu books published. When you're writing, Rochelle, do you find that it's easy most of the time, or do you encounter things like writer's block? From time to time, I get the writer's block, but most of the time, it just flows. I just start writing, it comes right on out. Then I get to writing, especially like the poems, you know, I get to write, I say, wow, did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you do then whenever you sit down, you want to write, but you get writer's block, no words are coming out. How do you get them going again? Just sit down with a pencil and start doodling. Hmm. <laughs> Eventually, those sentences will come together, and I say, okay, here we go. Don't be afraid to put your ideas on paper and put that way. So that's where it started, you know, a bunch of little sticky notes and stuff. When you write, do you like to write at a certain time and place, maybe late at night or early in the morning? Or do you find yourself writing kind of whenever you're inspired and the ideas are coming to you? Basically, that's it. Mm. Whenever the idea hit me, I ride the bus sometimes and the idea hit me. That's why I had to get the sticky notes or something. <laughs> you know, so I could just, where I'm at, no matter where I'm at, I have to, and I'd write a sentence on a piece of paper, and then once I sit down and really look at it, you know, ideas would just get to flowing. Hmm. Well, I encourage my listeners to check this book out. It's called The Adventures of AJ. This is written by Rochelle Phillips, and it's published by Covenant Books. 
You can jump online and grab this at Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes and also at traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, it's been wonderful having you on the show tonight, Rochelle. Thanks again for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. This book says it'll help you reconcile with God and recognize your value and reignite your dreams. It's called The Girl with the Low-Cut Dress. And the author, Gloria Restoy, is right here with me now to talk all about it. Gloria, thanks for being here with me tonight. Thank you so much for having me, Corey. It's my pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to have you here. Can you tell me all about The Girl with the Low-Cut Dress? Yes. This is a story of hope and of God's power as he leaves 99 sheep to rescue one that has been lost. Mm -hmm. This is my story. It's a Christian testimony of before Christ and after Christ and the power of redemption. It's a story of hope and love. It's basically about my parents. It starts out in Cuba in 1953, a few years before my parents met. My father was a politician. My mother was a young country girl. They met, they fell in love, and they had one child, a product of their union. That child is me. <laughs> And I write about the different struggles that they faced as they came into the United States and how they tried to acclimate. They met certain people here that were not very good acquaintances. And as a result, they became drug dealers in the 1970s. And so the story unravels with my life living with them for a short period of time with my mother because my father died when I was 10. Later, the things that I went through as I walked many dark paths of drug addiction, alcoholism. And it's basically a story where it's God being my benefactor through all the, the life that I led as a person that had no identity and a person that believed in her heart that she was an orphan. And so by believing those things, by having self-disqualification, by having limiting thoughts, I basically experienced many things that I should have never really lived, but yet mm -hmm. I made those decisions and I had to live with them, the decision of regret. And so by the grace of God, he enters my life and a victim became a victor. Mm -hmm. And I'm able, I lived through this life. I lived through the experiences to be able to tell a story. I'm of sound mind today. And I am able to fulfill that purpose and plan for which God called me. And I'm very happy because this is my life's work. Wow. What a story, Gloria. What inspired you to sit down and write your story for the world? Well, I lived this story as I could best describe it. I've given it blood, sweat, and tears. This is my memoir. And the inspiration was there in my spirit as I was collecting different notes throughout the years. And one day when I sat down and I was ready to write, I had the book saved in notes and notations that I had made throughout the years and I had been saving in a little special box. The inspiration is basically to bring hope and healing to the world, especially to young people today that have such an erroneous conception of God. I want to be able to give the world another view of God, a view that God is a father, that he is a good father, and that when we surrender and we seek him, he comes running to us mm -hmm. and the revelation of the Father is what the world needs today. I encourage my listeners to check this book out. It's called The Girl with the Low-Cut Dress. It's written by Gloria Restoy, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can find this everywhere, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes, and down the street at your local bookstore. Gloria, thank you again for joining me here tonight and telling me all about your book, The Girl with the Low-Cut Dress. I had a really fun time talking. Likewise, Corey. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Henry Flick, the human stick, helps carry the load. 
It's the new children's book. It's out in stores now, written by Will Wardlaw, and Will is right here with me now to talk all about it. Will, thanks for joining me tonight. Hey, absolutely, Corey. Thanks for uh, having me. Well, thank you for being here. Can you tell me all about what we can expect in Henry Flick, the Human Stick Helps Carry the Load? Well, it's a children's book, right, where Henry is struggling with, I think, something many kids and young people maybe struggle with, trying to do things on their own. And mm -hmm. Henry realizes through helping somebody that it's good to have friends and to work together and help each other out. A human stick. Will, you got to tell me where this idea came from. <laughs> well, in all honesty, it came from the fact that I am a terrible artist. <laughs> Originally, I had the idea of trying to do everything myself to write it and illustrate it as well as publish it. And I just got to the point where I realized that probably wasn't a great idea. A stick figure was where I was headed because I'm a terrible artist. And then I had a friend of a friend, Kelly Young, who's the illustrator, I had just had a conversation with her and she drew up a couple of sketches and what she drew, I just fell in love with. And that's what Henry is today. Was this a long process for you from the time you started writing it up until it got out and got published? I would say all in all, the, the time I put into it, it was maybe about a year and a half, two years. Hmm. I had the idea a few years ago and really worked on writing it in the story. And that actually, that came quickly. But then circumstances, I'm a teacher and have young kids myself. And so life kind of happened and kind of put on the back burner. And then I got to the point where I said, hey, I really need to pursue this. And I found Fulton Books and it was a great fit for me and what I needed and what they provided and worked with them and then the illustrator to get it all together. And that part was very smooth and quick. But the longer part was me really working up the steam to follow through with it. Mm. Will, is this your first time in the arena of writing and publishing? It is. I have had some thoughts over the years of ideas for books, but this was the first one that really came to fruition, hmm. mostly just inspired by my own children and reading to them when they were younger. And this I, whole idea just spurred from what I had been reading to them and, and feeling like there were a lot of books out there that maybe didn't have a very clear message mm -hmm. for young kids. And I thought, hey, what a great thing to produce to have a book that has a clear message. And I thought this would be a great start for my publishing future. Yeah, congratulations on getting your first one out there. I can't imagine Thanks. what the moment was like for you when you got that first copy and what was that like? It was great. I'm a big dreamer. I have a lot of uh, a lot of ideas that mm. kind of enter into my life and my train of thought. And oftentimes those dreams just fall flat. And so for this one to really happen and for me to follow through with it and put the work in and the time in. It was a great feeling of satisfaction and accomplishment. Well, what's your best advice for authors who are just starting out and have this big, daunting project of writing and publishing ahead of them? That's a great question. For me personally, I really had to be intentional about setting aside time to focus on it. Mm. Being a teacher and having other jobs, having kids, my family, if I didn't set that time aside specifically and almost schedule it for myself, it never would have happened. So I would say any future writer, just be sure that you're dedicating that time to really investing in what you're trying to share and produce. Mm. I know a lot of my listeners are definitely going to enjoy this book and should check it out. It's called Henry Flick, The Human Stick Helps Carry the Load. It's written by Will Wardlaw and it's published by Fulton Books. You can pick this up online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Google Play, and also down the street at your traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Will, thanks again for coming on the show. I love learning about Henry Flick, The Human Stick, and really looking forward to what's coming next. Thanks again for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me, Corey. I appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, 
and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Podserve, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.